Hi everyone, Professor Mark Sheriff here with a quick programming note before we get into the episode. Just wanted to let you know that this is going to be the last episode that we post on YouTube. Now, we love our YouTube listeners and y'all are wonderful and awesome, but the time for getting a YouTube video up versus our ability to keep up with statistics as to who is downloading the podcast where, it's just gotten a little crazy pants. So, if you're enjoying the content, and we really hope that you are, you would really, really help us out if you would go to Spotify or to Apple Podcasts or the podcast service of your choice and subscribe there. So it keeps all of our statistics in one place so we can get a, get a better idea of who is listening to the show, how many people are listening to the show, and you know what we need to do to you know keep making the show grow. So thank you so much for listening here on YouTube. Hope you enjoy this last YouTube episode. Um, we really hope that you go and subscribe elsewhere and we can keep up with you there. So take care, be safe and watch for falling goats. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to Regrade Request, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And my name is Professor Mark Sheriff. And Will, uh, Will, uh, do, do you know what the, do you know what the first uh, day was where we released episode one? Do you remember, do you know what day that was by any chance? I don't. It was it, summer-ish, I believe. It was, it was. May 27th. Okay. May 27th, 2021. And now we made it to the end of October and we missed our first week. We did. We did. I mean, we, if, if we, we did count ha the half episodes. So I think it's fair to say yeah. that you know, the half episodes, you know, okay, that's kind of a half measure, certainly. But this is the first. We legit missed a week. And yes. I think, you know, we need to treat this like. Our students who treat it, we're going to our, our our listeners. They are the professors here. They are the ones in charge. They are the ones asking for this sweet, sweet content. And by our listeners, I do mean my mom and dad who use this primarily to know whether their sweet baby boy is still alive. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. I am. I got the birthday present. Love you both. What do we do? Do we uh, uh, just... Pro uh, profe <coughs> professor Sheriff's mom, Professor Sheriff's dad, uh, can I get an extension? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Do we, do we get an extension on this? Do we own up to it and just say, look, I, I November, honestly, November and, and early December is kind of the worst time to be a professor. It yeah. really is like the absolute worst. Yeah. <laughs> because all the major stuff is coming due. We're tired. The students are tired. And, and basketball season starts and now no one really wants to come. Yeah. Um, WV looks rough, by the way. We <laughs> won, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I think part of it too is just, there's sort of this feel of work. There's this kind of period of high activity at the end of the term, but you have the end of the term. So like, that's the carrot on the end of the stick that you're being beaten with. And in November, it's kind of just all stick. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, I am tired of stick, I think. Yeah, that's stick. Yeah, it, it, it tends to hit you where, yeah. Anyway, so we apologize for missing a week. I would like to say it's not going to happen again over the next two weeks, but that would probably be it, or next yeah. couple months. But that's an outright lie. Uh, but we'll try to let you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it, it just might be that, you know, um, during this time period, we go a little bit more, I don't know, you know, a little bit more on occasion, but. Yeah. We're still here. I, We're still I mean, coming. Hey, at least it's not the end of the world. Uh, you know, I was... Segways are weird. Segways are weird. They're great when you ride on them through Epcot. Look, I, I was going to ask... You know, is this really the week to do? Because we were going to do Into the World as we were coming up on Halloween. That made right. sense. Now it's my birthday. Of course, I'm turning 42, so I'm just old. So maybe Into the World is wholly appropriate mm -hmm. but that's what we have queued up and oh my god so what was your what was your thinking about this this idea this topic so i th i think there's a lot of gloom and doom every time 
you know, a, a, an you election turn on rolls the around. Yeah, or you turn on the news. Um, but there's this idea, I, I think, that um, some people tend to believe that ultimately, you know, society will hold itself together. And I think when we look at the history of the world, Society does a good job of being actually fairly stable, but when it does start to fail, it tends to fail quickly. And, um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm fascinated by a few of the things we're going to talk about. This is sort of my, uh, excuse to talk about AI, which is something I'm, I'm very interested in talking about. Okay. Um, that, that's part of it, too, admittedly. But... You mean the movie AI that had, like, what was, was Will Smith in that? Am I thinking um, of the right movie? I think that's I I am robot. That's there I, was a movie I, called robot. AI, yeah. which was the most overlong movie I've ever seen in my entire life. It's that about says something. It's about a kid. It's like a a robot kid that is self aware, and it's like an hour longer than it should have been. If it were half as long as it actually was, I think I made this conversation longer than it needed to be just by bringing that up. Though, so okay, yeah. so so where do you want to start? Where well, do you want to so start? First, do you want to let's talk about like what the end of the world entails? Uh, with the end of the world, oh, we are specifically okay. well. Hang on, we are specifically talking about human civilization as we know it. I am not saying that the planet will be destroyed. I'm not even stipulating that that life on Earth will be unable to continue in its current form. I am specifically saying human civilization as we know it would fall apart. And there's there's a question as to how stable that is. For example, uh, the, the Fermi paradox. Where are all the aliens? You know, if if you if you do the math, even if you make, you know, very, very safe assumptions. There's this thing called the Drake Equation. The idea is, take the number of stars in the galaxy, multiply it by the average number of planets per stars, then multiply that by the percentage of those planets that could support, uh, that are in a Goldilocks zone, that, that could have liquid water, uh, as we're in this case assuming life like Earth-like life, so ruling out potential like methane life forms. Um... Multiply that by the number of those planets which produce bacteria. And again, we don't actually know what these numbers are. We'd have, we'd have no idea what percentage. We only have one, pra- well, like three practical use cases, uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Um, and you kind of just add on these knock-on effects. But even if you make very, very, very safe assumptions about uh, how long it would take a... a or how many planets could produce life. Like, very, very weak assumptions. It's still hard to square the circle, given just how many stars there are in our own galaxy, ruling out other galaxies, that we haven't seen any signs of alien life at all. Because, if you think about it from just a straight math standpoint, let's assume that once a society reached spacefaring age... Every 1,000 years, that planet sends a colony, a colony group out to another planet, right? And, then, and they do terraforming and everything. And then in 1,000 years, both of them send out. In 1,000 years, all four of them send out. In 1,000 years, all eight send out. If you do that math, you could still colonize basically the entire galaxy in, in a few million years. For context... We're yeah, you know, we estimate that that our universe is about thirteen point seven billion years old. So where are the aliens? Or maybe you, I think you actually only need a couple hundred thousand years. So where I are mean, the aliens? I mean, but isn't one? I don't think I want to know. But two, I mean, isn't part of it just that in 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 the scope of that billion years, mm-hmm. you know, life on Earth has only been able to be paying attention to the stars for the briefest of oh, microseconds. Yeah, Correct. So, but, I mean... But I, I would counter that it took us very little time to using the stars for navigation to studying them in great detail and understanding their makeup. That That is, in fact, an incredibly short sliver of time, and it's exponential, in fact. Sure. But but so the, one, one of the ideas of the Fermi paradox, the, the solutions to it, one is just that 
there are aliens everywhere and we're stupid. We don't see them. But one is this thing called the Great Filter. It's an idea that, in theory, a, a society has some great filter between it and a spacefaring age. And for whatever reason, societies don't cross that. And the question would then be, what is that great filter? Which leads me to talking about Nick Bostrom. And one of the things that he talks about is the nature that scientific progress could lead us to ending the world. And here's the idea. Thought experiment. What okay. if microwaving sand could produce a small thermonuclear explosion? It can't. It's just going to get sand in your microwave. Don't do it. But what if it could? What if there were some simple-to-do way to create a nuclear weapon? Could society survive that? Because it's hard to make a nuclear okay. weapon. Okay. Yes. Could it? Yes. If irrational no, I mean, is actors it hard to make could simp could easily easily make a tool that could effectively act like a nuclear weapon without having to you know refine uranium without having to find a way to transport etc i don't think it could if something that trivial c could result in i that. mean this is I mean, this isn't this is a thought exercise that we often do in game design when mm -hmm. we're doing world building. You know, if, if, for instance, if you think about something dungeon, I mean, I'm taking this a slight tangent, not that I don't feel like we're tangenting all over the place right now. But re regardless, um, in in game design, in like Dungeons and Dragons, there is a there's like a ring of invisibility. What mm -hmm. if a ring of invisibility actually did exist? How would that just fundamentally change how you thought mm -hmm. about the way society existed? And, and you start going down this path and you're like. Oh wait, <laughs> uh, you know if, if some of these magic powers actually did exist, it how would anything actually manage mm -hmm. to work out? It and you know this is a similar thing. I mean, I mean, look at Twitter. I, if we can't handle that, I doubt we'd handle micro microwave sand bombs. Right, microwave sand bombs. Ish. Well, the the, the point being that is there some theoretically incredibly destructive technology that is easily harnessable that we either don't know about yet or don't appreciate yet. The And the way Nick Bostrom <laughs> frames it is if you think of all human inventions, the idea is we're reaching into some hat that we don't know what's inside of it and we pull a ball out effectively. That's an invention. And some of them are really good, like antibiotics, which has saved, I mean, just... Vaccines. In, I'm a fan. Vaccines yeah, are great. Vaccines. Um, you know, antibiotics, and and when you talk about it, it's like, well, but antibiotics are, are being overused. Yeah, but the only reason that's a problem is because antibiotics were so good at solving the problem of bacterial infections. Um, you look at some that, frankly, aren't great inventions in terms of make in terms of ensuring the stability of the future of humanity, like nuclear weapons, for example. Right, you look at a lot that have that are a mixed bag. Things like the harnessing of fossil fuels, which have created, which raised the standard of life around the world, and might also be responsible for lowering it when, as 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 global warming ramps up. But the question is: Is there some ball in there, some idea in there that we reach in and grab it and pull it out, and that invention um, cannot coexist with a long-lasting civilization? Uh, is some, your argument is your argument going to be that we're a transition to true AI? Uh, eventually, what there there's some people who argue we've already done this with CRISPR, which is uh, a, a bioengineering tool, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, um, for example, in in a uh, one variant of the flu that's incredibly deadly is um, it's it's H five N. One, I think. I, I could be I getting the numbers wrong. Or H1N5. Pig, bird, if there's a chicken. five and a one. Anyway, okay. That particular uh, flu has literally, like, even with the best medical treatment, like an eighty to ninety percent fatality rate. But can it's we not, not talk about more deadly viruses? But I think I've had enough of that. Except, okay. they've been working on it in the lab, and they've actually produced an airborne version by modifying it. <laughs> And evolving it over generations. And that's a concern because things leave labs sometimes. Uh, case in point, the um, the anthrax attacks 
uh, in the early 2000s were from United States labs. That's where the anthrax came from. This is not a controversial thing. They they left the lab. I don't like this conversation. <laughs> yeah. So 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 that's that's the point. Is there some technology out there? I will talk about AI later, but I wanted to I've I've dominated the floor enough. What's your end of the world scenario that you love? Well, oh, that I love. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, what's your think, favorite uh, way to to die? Oh, okay. Let's, you know, uh, I, I had a lot of fried chicken for dinner tonight. So that kind of is up there. Um, it was, it was delicious. Um, I don't, so, okay. So you, so you're, 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 you're bringing kind of the, the, the dark realism. I don't know if this is, uh, I, the, the article that I wanted to talk about that I want to transition into Mm -hmm. is that, did you know that in 1973, there was actually a program, an algorithm, a, a simulation that was um, authored and sponsored by a group called World One at MIT in 1973 to predict when the end of the world would happen. Mm-hmm. And it and so have, have you heard about this by any no, chance? No, actually, I have not. So I, I came upon this when I was looking for for the end of the world scenarios, and here is. A quote from a news source uh, after they ran this program back in 1973 about when the first major milestone would occur. Around 2020, the state of the planet will be very critical. If we do nothing to stop it, the quality of life will drop to zero. In 2020, mm-hmm. what happened? <laughs> I was like, ah! It predicted. Now, in all fairness, yeah. the prediction here was around pollution. Correct. And that pollution was going to be so bad that we were, I mean, yes, we're still in a bad state as far as pollution goes, but you still read that first line and you're like, 2020 wasn't so hot. Uh, if we think back. Yeah. Yeah, it and, was not. Um, and there was, there was a little bit of breakdown in society as well. Just a just a smidgen little brain as society. In case you're curious, um, the the next major milestone that we expected to hit, where quote civilized life as we know it on this planet will end, it's between 2040 and 2050. So okay. get that on the calendar, um, because so far this program was able to sort of predict um, that something uh, <laughs> horrible was going to happen there in um, in 2020. Um, but yeah. So this is well. There, there's 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 a little thing that that happens there though, which um, you know it predicted that pollution would become so critical that life, uh, you know, at, at civilization as we know it couldn't really survive that. The quality of life as we know it couldn't survive that. Um, the United States, especially, but but globally, since the 1970s, there's actually been a lot of good laws. To help on pollution. Certainly not all of them. We still have global warming, of course. There's still water pollution, etc. But it's better than it was. And the thing is, this this trick kind of gets played a bit by I don't I don't even want to call them global warming skeptics because I I, I think many of them aren't actually skeptical. Uh, and they have ulterior motives, we'll say. But um for instance, people will say, well, we haven't warmed as much by, by 2020 as people expected in the 1990s. And it's like, we, I mean, yeah, because we worked on it. Yeah, we worked on it. Right. We missed the target by a little bit because we worked on it a little bit. We're still bad. <laughs> like, we're still yeah. a lot warmer than we should be. And yeah, just because we didn't warm as much as the worst case scenario doesn't mean therefore all our problems are solved. Yeah. 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 Um, but so now let's transition talking about AI. Okay. All right. I, I don't I didn't have a segue for that. Um I don't think there is a good segue for that. I I no. you know, how do you transition from well, okay, this was a program. Mm-hmm. That predicted the end of the world. Right. Let's talk about other programs that will do the end of the world. So let's talk or, or maybe about the, Skynet. Yeah, or mm-hmm. maybe that that very algorithm has been learning this whole time, learning how to end the world to make its prediction true. It's been embarrassed by twenty twenty. Oh. No, um. So the algorithm is upset that it missed its target. So now it will take over. Yeah. I'm glad there's you, a there's a movie there. There yeah. is a movie there. <laughs> 
a very I, bad one. Yeah, they're, they're like the movies that feature Skynet. Um, speaking of Skynet, <laughs> AI terrifies me, and that's not because I'm worried about Skynet. I am not worried about malevolent robots deciding that they want to eradicate humanity via complicated time travel. That that seems no. We have insurrectionists for that. No. Oh boy. <laughs> Sorry. So here is the thing that worries me. Okay. Facebook. Not in the specific, kind of in the specific, but but more in the general. Social media does this. What we have is we have a a algorithm that is incredibly powerful and incredibly capable of achieving its goal, which is engagement, which is getting you on a platform, engaging on a platform, showing that platform to other people and engaging with it all the time, every day yeah. for, for no Social reason. manipulation. Right. Social engineering. It's really good at keeping you engaged. And side effects and consequences of that be damned, frankly. Yeah. Um, we saw this with, I mean, just wide scale misinformation that I, you know, I saw, I saw things like this on Facebook back even in the early days when I like when I, the early days of Facebook. So I, I think I joined it in like 2006 when I went to college and by then you still needed a college email to join Facebook. You could only join Facebook in a college email and you could only add friends who were like at your college. Um, this was it was a very different experience then. It was, yeah, yeah. Um, but as it went to transition to like status updates and having a wall where you post links, that's when it kind of started to shift a bit, and I started to see a lot more of the. Um, as they could, I think the first time I noticed it was two thousand eight, with. Um, one of my RAs that I, I worked with at WVU was in a Facebook group called Nobama, which uh, uh, basically just worked on the, uh, the, the the very racist birtherism theory. And it was an incredibly oh, uh, racist fun. group. Right. And that was kind of the first time that I noticed, like, wow, the, these things are kind of spreading pretty quick. And so, I, I, yes, it's gotten worse. Um, and yes, there's evidence that has been used in, in foreign, uh, we'll say, agitation operations. Um, mm. <laughs> but there is a misalignment between what our goals as humans theoretically would be, which is towards a, a more shared consensus of what is true in the world. Uh, that That goal is not part of social media algorithms. I don't want to single out Facebook. It's just the one I have the most experience with. Um, but it allows for these, these misalignments that frankly have led to an extraordinarily polarized country. Um, that has led to just widespread misinformation about vaccines. Um, information that literally just I don't remember existing as a child. I don't remember this level of skepticism. I knew like there was some of it, but nothing, nothing that I remember. Granted, I was a kid. I didn't know much of what was going on in the world. You're so, like, a bright even, kid. Even when I was in high school, I don't remember anything like this. Like you know, when I no. when, when I was going to college, like oh by the way, you should get the meningitis vaccine. I'm like okay, sure, and I. Just got it. I didn't realize like that. I didn't even know that meningitis was this, this incredibly deadly thing. I'm like, oh, look, another another miracle cure for a disease that once plagued humanity. And now at worst shows up every once a decade and somewhere like, yeah, sure. Jab me. Um, and, and this gets to the crux of what I worry about with AI, which is that we have really complicated problems to solve. And so we develop our technology and part of our, our our technology right now is artificial intelligence. And we develop these models to solve these problems. And the question is, what happens when we either define the objective uh, that is not beneficial to humanity, in, in the case of social media, or 
Uh, we define an objective with the best of intentions, but due to uh, f- due to faulty assumptions or blind spots, we end up with an incorrect assumption. Uh, an example that's often given is, oh, well, let's program self-driving cars to get you to the airport as fast as possible. And it gets to the airport as fast as possible and then slams on the brakes and you die from, you know, blunt, blunt force trauma from hitting your head on the dashboard. Like, that's an that's well, a sh- extreme cartoonish example, but the point is, there's a lot of unknowns there that could have that could happen. Well, something that's a little bit more tame than auto death, I suppose that that you know something from Grand Theft Auto that you got going on there that we talk about in our class, as a matter of fact, is the use of of basic data mm-hmm. analysis or AI for making. Um, uh, enrollment decisions at colleges yep. or hiring decisions to make first passes through mm-hmm. various uh, applications. And, you know, this comes from a place of, hey, we're writing this algorithm because this organization is getting hundreds and thousands of applications and no one can actually go through them. And so if we're not, it, it, it's just to the chance of that someone will see this application. So what if we wrote an AI that can go through and Now, again, this is not... Yeah, yeah. People need to realize that when when we say AI, that does not necessarily mean that we are talking about some sort of incredible self learning, self deciding mm-hmm. algorithm. I mean, the basic form of AI that we use on a day to day that I use on a day to day basis is would be in a video game, which just is hey, it is an AI for a Goomba to walk back and forth because mm-hmm. it is just a computer making a decision for the set of actions. But what happens in these in these cases is someone writes this algorithm, as you say, they have a blind spot. And we talk about this when we talk about diversity and equity and inclusion and, and when we're creating software, is it happens that people of and we saw this uh, with uh, using various test scores that students who were from lower um, uh, lower less affluent schools, high schools to go into college, their scores were docked in mm-hmm. a way that it was actually being discriminatory. Right. And so, yeah, there, there's real consequences. I mean, this is not mm-hmm. as necessarily creating insurrections or, or auto death as you so, uh, you know, gave mm-hmm. us. Um, but these are real consequences that are happening all over the place. It could be as simple as, you know, things like um, an algorithm that's just trying to remove the background from a Zoom call. Yep. And it was written written by a bunch of white guys. And so someone with a darker skin tone, they get just removed from the image. Yeah. And, 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 and to be clear, not maliciously. Effects. And not, not maliciously, but just from a lack of, frankly, a a a, a an effective test. Cultural a test well, audience. That cultural competence. Right. Yeah. Uh just you know, the algorithm was designed and tested with, hey, here are people in the office, let's put them in, you know, and the office lacked uh, uh, critical diversity um, as an example of how that could emerge. But so we're, right now we're kind of touching a bit on what I want to talk about very briefly, which is modeled versus unmodeled learning. And I'm not going to do a whole explanation. That could be a question in itself. Someone ask it if you're interested. But the short version is uh, modeled AI is, hey, let's design how we want the computer to solve this problem. Unmodeled is, hey, let's have a computer that un- that knows only the basic rules to chess, knows nothing of strategy, only knows, hey, this is a win and this is not a win, and here are the moves I'm allowed to make. That's it. Let's have it play chess. Oh, it sucks at it? Well, let's have it play it again. In fact, let's, let's have it play itself. And all it's going to do is just sit there, round the clock, burning a processor, just playing itself in chess hundreds of thousands of times, over and over and over. And... As it plays, it's going to learn which strategies are effective. And then, okay, after we've done this for a bit, let's take it and, oh, what's that? It's destroying every human player who's ever lived, and no human is ever going to beat the best AI, stockfish.j, or stockfish.js, which anyone can download online, and so long as you have processing power, can play faster than any reasonable human being. Oh, well, okay, that's cool. That idea of a, a, a computer building a model that we can't understand, that model doesn't output like an if a collection of if-else statements that a human being can look at and be like, okay, I understand why it's making those decisions. We don't know 
And a lot of times it'll make a move that to a human is very surprising, but ends up mm-hmm. being a brilliant move that a human wouldn't necessarily consider. Um, and the, the fear is that this seeding of human, human expertise to AI expertise is a one way street. The best human at chess is never going to be better than the best AI at chess ever again. Uh, you know, unless we have a massive EMP or something, then who knows? But <laughs> what what other areas, you know, the, the these out al- the algorithms that are being used by social media to reveal content, again, very likely unmodeled, uh, with the objective of generating a reaction. So what videos can I show you that are gonna generate a reaction? That does not mean a like. That does not mean you saying, wow, this is golly gee willikers, this is great content. That could mean, wow, this flat earth video is full of crap. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. Algorithm goes, oh, he responded. Let's let's shove more down your face. Um, and it doesn't it, and have I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm not saying no, no attempts have been made to improve this problem. Just saying again, once again. The objective, it's so good at solving it, but in a way that we can't easily explain or even understand clearly. Yeah. And you don't even have to make a response to it. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, the the apps know when you pause mm-hmm. during a scroll and, you know, can say, oh, this, you know, this made them stop for a moment. Ah, you know, there, there's all sorts of little pieces of data that can be thrown mm-hmm. in here. And, and And the fear is that as AI... And I know I'm, uh, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Uh, as AI extends into more fields, one of the thing, one of the fundamental barriers that we worry about is brittle versus broad AI, narrow versus broad. Um, for example, that chess playing computer, it turns out that they were able to take it and also teach it Go because it's a grid based game. The, the same mm-hmm. learning model, just, you know, different rules, different board, but the same idea. That same model is probably going to do a pretty bad job at, you know, learning how to make the best macaroni and cheese, right? It's not <laughs> going to be able to learn across spectrum, Want to taste macaroni, must add more mozzarella. Yeah. Cheese is good. Well, so, but we're there. There is one AI program. Um, <laughs> Deadpan, no response yeah. to the cheese joke. I love yeah. it. Thank you. I'm so, so glad we came back after two weeks. You don't even laugh at my stupid <laughs> cheese joke. There, Golly. But, so the, there is one where w- one guy programmed, um, it's mar.io. And it is an AI designed to play Mario games. And it was designed as an April Fool's joke, but it actually worked really well. And what's interesting is that with the same rule set, it could learn to play other NES games with the same objectives, the same goals. Not every NES game, but ones that were structured fairly similarly. Um, And the thing is, you know, we talk about gaming the system. The AI naturally does that. So, for instance, in the original Super Mario Brothers, you know how you're invincible when you're falling down? So even if an enemy lands on top of you, it dies and you're fine? Okay, if you didn't know that, that happens in Super Mario Brothers. If you're falling down in in the original Super Mario Brothers, if Mario is falling, he is invincible. So if, if a Goomba drops above you, because the game does have gravity acceleration... Yeah. And you're and you like walk off like not not onto the like if you fall in the pit you die. But if you walk like off a ledge that's lower, but you're falling down, if it lands on you, you survive. You're you invincible have while falling. when you're falling? When you're falling. When you're I'm rising, look this you up don't. Later. But when you're falling, you are invulnerable. If an enemy hits you, the enemy dies. The AI naturally uses this maneuver. This is a very advanced, like, human speedrunning trick that can be used in a couple narrow cases to save a frame if you're doing something like uh, a full game warpless run. But the AI just uses it all the time, because it can. Um, So it naturally does things that humans wouldn't really even think to do. And the theory is... Okay, so it could learn across NES games, but it still can't help self-driving cars. That's the fundamental barrier. We are able to take lessons we learn from one thing, 
and, and apply them elsewhere. So when students are in our class today learning design patterns, they can also then immediately go to their next class, which might be architecture, which is very, very different, and they can learn there with the same brain. They don't have to change brains out, right? Um, bold assumption I make that students are learning in either say, class. I was like, but, I was trying to not say something there. <laughs> but the point being... If we break that barrier, I, I think we have an issue where the most intelligent thing on the planet would be artificial. And at that point, that's where we run into the idea of the singularity, which is uh, it's often misrepresented in, in pop culture as the moment we can download our brains on the computer. It's not what it is. The idea of the singularity is uh, technology is an exponential curve, and the curve gets so steep that humans' brains are just not capable of meaningfully keeping up with it, and that our technology is designing our technology. And at that point, our ability to kind of prognosticate the future, technologically speaking, is no longer relevant, um, because we're not the driver anymore. We're the passenger now. That's, you know, how sci-fi you think that is uh, varies from person to person. Some people say, like, okay... You know, I, I, uh, I'm not saying they're right, but but some people would say like, OK, well, you know, how long until we hit this point, this idea where the most intelligent things are these machines, which are capable of making decisions that are incredibly effective that we don't understand. And, so you know, you've had people say like, oh, you know, maybe 2100 or some will say it'll never happen or some will say, you know, it's 2025, which is well. They asked this in like 2011, and some people said 2020. So, you know, take yeah, it for well, what you will. But we're supposed to have flying cars. If we're you, supposed to yeah. have flying cars. If you were to take an average there, and I'm not saying that's an accurate measure, but if you were to take an average, they'd say something like 50 to 80 years. Okay, now imagine that we got a message from outer space. Hey, humans, okay. we finally found you. We'll, we're on our way. Space is big. It's going to take a while. It's going to take 80 years. We'll get there in 80 years. How do you think that changes humanity? And why do we not have that same response when we have the same concern about something potentially far more intelligent than capable in us being on the planet with us? Uh, that's my fear. How sci-fi people think that is, it's up to you. But oh my God. I think we should muster the same kind of response as, as we would for said alien message. And we should start thinking about those problems now. Because I don't think we're going to stop trying to improve our AI. Man, okay. I just wanted to go play Animal Crossing now and not think of this. Why did you do this to me? I'm going to have existential crises all night long now. Yeah. You, 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 yeah, I, 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 find the, I find the story about the, the, the program that predicted 2020. And my other story, by the way, is about why, why is it important that you should recycle your old electronics and so mm -hmm. that we can, you know, save, save the planet. And, and you're like, by the way, here's this doom scenario that's going to be like, oh, my God, I've got. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess the. The, the way that it's been framed, the, the reason I kind of bring it up is I think the immediate reaction that I first had when I heard, like, so it was like a Nick Bostrom TED Talk, and it's like, oh, that's so cool. And that's the problem, because nobody's like, oh, global warming is is is, is going to potentially make it to where our children and grandchildren can, can't even approach the standard of living we have now. Oh, that's so interesting. I really like this TED Talk. Nobody has that reaction. Because it's scary. But like, oh, hey, what's that? We won't understand decisions that are being made around us all the time by entities that we are nothing like. Oh, that's that's so interesting. That's so cool. I wonder what the future will be like there. No, like that, that shouldn't be the reaction. I don't know. I have it, to be clear. I'm, I'm, I, I have that reaction. I'm just saying it shouldn't be that. You had the fear reaction. So that you had the healthy one. So it's important to recycle your old electronics <laughs> because many of them have toxic substances. I'm just going to skip to, I'm just going <laughs> to jump to a question from professors subreddit because I think okay. we need to go someplace. I'm going to, I'm going to flex birthday privilege. All right. Fair enough. I am fine with this. 
I want you to rate how impressive this cheating scheme is. Okay. Uh, are we doing Likert 1 to 4, or are we doing the traditional, like, 1 to 10? Uh, you rate it on the on scale of whatever makes you... On, I'm, a, I'm on, a big fan uh, of Likert 4 scale. I'll stick with that. Okay, sure. Recently, I've been told about this through one of my students who's trying to apply for internships for next summer. He was applying to jobs via... A blank out the company name. He was applying to jobs through an online job site, and a company gave him a take-home assessment. Pretty, you know, pretty normal for CS. They give you a program, go do this, and come back with it, and we'll look at the code. Mm -hmm. The take-home assessment assessment was a project I had assigned earlier in the week that was due at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Basically, what happened was the student in the class created a fake job and a fake company on this company on this job hunting website and posted the assignments from the class as the hey go do this oh, to show wow. me to show me that you are ready for my job here's your my competency fake... check yeah <laughs> oh god i remember like there was there was a period where that was something that was just done very publicly i remember i think i was in undergrad and uh, facebook had like hey here's six questions to solve Solve them and send it to us, and we'll we'll reach out to see if you're interested in the job. And I'm like, uh, I'm an undergrad. I want to make money. I, I had a dream of moving out west. Then, um, I not not that didn't fail because I, I mean, yeah, I I, I didn't make it out west ever, but I didn't really <laughs> want to anymore. But nonetheless, wow. Hey, let let's let's. Let's crowdsource from the internet. How can I do that? I know. Let's tether fake money in front of them. <sighs> I it's yeah. This one. This one. Because the thing is, is I I read this. And I'm like, oh my god, that literally could be projects from our class because of the way that we structure. Now we already have the problem where students submit our project to other classes and mm -hmm. they say, "Oh, look at this cool web project for this other web class that we potentially could do." But I saw this, I was like, "Wow, that's next level." I I rate I, you know, on your Likert scale, I, I rate this as a that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's a, and that's, that's a, not that's even That's a strongly agree. Uh, well, strongly agree that it's creative. Um strongly disagree that you should do it. I'll say. Oh, okay. I think are the teachers going to come out and not and say don't cheat? Yeah. Wow. That's uh, uh what, what, that's Well, yeah, I mean, when I go on Reddit like our college and I say like why are professors cracking down on cheating so much? Oh, I you know. And yeah, because professors hate you and they're all evil. Like those those are like typical responses that get just massive upvotes. Yeah. I mean, the ones that we're seeing, of course, on the UVA subreddit right now is why doesn't CS have enough faculty to actually teach their classes? <laughs> it's like, well, one, there's a lot of you. Two, there's a lot of us going on sabbatical and parental leave. And sorry, I feel bad now, but for those it is who, what it's happening. For those who aren't in computer science to explain the phenomena, when I graduated in 2010, that was close to the post dot com bust low point. It was like around like nine to ten thousand uh, BS degrees a year or something like that um, in computer science, and now like it's above like thirty five thousand, I believe. And uh, not not obviously not at UVA nationally, um, but I graduated in two thousand ten. Like that's not that eleven years is not a lot of time for more than triple growth. Yeah, it's it's been fast. Yeah. It has been fast. Much like the growth, not only of AI, but also the growth of my fear of everything now. Thank you. Glad like, I that's, help. that's really that's yeah. really the true gift you gave me for my birthday. You gave me a a beautiful video game that's meant to be peaceful and calming. And here is some existential dread just yeah. to go right on top of it. Yeah, it uh. It's a, he, he, really he, a combo platter. Here is here is here is the solace I will give you. Okay, give me some solace. I remember a big cup of solace. In like 2016, I okay. was talking to students about ethics in uh, software engineering. I talked about self-driving cars, 
And the thing I, I said was I pulled up all of, you know, Chevrolet and Tesla and, and all these reports talking about their goal to have self-driving cars on the road by the end of 2019. So there's your solace. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot harder than it sounds in practice. It is. It is. It is. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's Although, good to be back. Yeah. It's good to be back, back on, back on the airwaves. Uh, thank you to everyone for spending a little bit of time with us to talk about the state of the world, the state of everything, the state of where the world is going. A special hello to our newest listener, Angela, who has been binging on our, our, our colleague, um, binging on the episodes. And so, you know, honestly, honestly, we should probably have her on yeah. to talk about cybersecurity stuff. I think I think we could definitely have a, a third professor I, I, to, t- to talk uh, about that. Yeah. I would absolutely be in favor of that. Uh, uh, I'm I, half expecting at some point, like one of our colleagues is going to get really mad at my cryptocurrency rant. Uh, that'll, I, I don't, I don't think it will be. He's not going to listen to it. So yeah. don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know we make a Someone, podcast. Someone's just like, you guys are wrong about this. That's. <laughs> have we have we had it see this is it have we had a conversation about nfts because nfts are now the, the we, thing that seems to be popping up i think I'm, i feel like we talked about it briefly i know we've talked about it at least briefly um it's it's like cryptocurrency but but even stupider like even basically even more unimaginably ripe to rip people off Oh, it's not even that. I mean, well, it is that. Um, there was there was a there was an NFT conference that took place in New York. Did did uh, people right so- click the program and save it and share it around oh, with everyone else? Oh, oh, there's an article on the Verge. You should go read yeah. it about what happened. It was glorious. But the thing that's been happening recently, though, is that there's been more conversation about the use of. We should just say this really quick. What is an NFT? The basic idea is: can you own a digital asset? is basically right. what it boils down to that there is a single single is really hard to say here because you can right click and save images yeah. but imagine that you could have some sort of digital object and you own it so yes it's been used for digital art which is dumb because you could just copy paste it but then in the gaming world people have been saying well what if you could generate an object and then you own that object that lives in a game mm-hmm. and then you could take that object between multiple games and there have been multiple game creators and designers who have been posting on twitter and, and various blogs about this won't work and it, you just you know it just doesn't work mm-hmm. and of course even through this there was an article on i believe it was bloomberg that said imagine if you could own mario and no one else could use mario and it's like no game company ever would make this decision yeah. because you would never anyway regardless um i, I th- that's something we could potentially talk about yeah. in in the future but not now, yeah. not now, because we're going to do better and not have episodes going north of 60 minutes right now. Yeah, we're going to have something a little bit more targeted. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. It's good to be back. Thank you for sticking with us. If you have not had opportunity to subscribe to the podcast, please go to regraderequest.com where you can find links to uh, Apple Podcasts, to Spotify, to the other podcast catchers of your choice. Just do a search for Regrade Request. You will find us there. If you have an opportunity to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, that would be fantastic. There's been some five-star reviews that have been left. Thank you so much. If you are the person who have done that, you, no one left any text, so I can't read them. <laughs> but there have been some five stars. And so that that makes us all warm and fuzzy. We already have better evaluations than our teaching evaluations. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. So um, if you have a question that you would like for us to uh, to talk about on the show, reach out to us, hosts at regraderequest.com, or you can go to regraderequest.com and record an audio message right there on the page. We'd love to play it on the show, assuming that it is you know, PG and that we can actually do that. I don't, we have, I'm not really worried about <laughs> spammed with bad messages, but maybe we should do that. So for myself and for professor Will McBurney, take care, be safe and watch for falling goats. What if we ah. trained an unmodeled AI to drop goats as efficiently as possible, like maximize the number of goats falling in it? What if we microwaved goats? Would that make a nuclear reaction? <laughs> <laughs>